my name's Thomas. Um, I'm a fifth year medic at Oriel, and obviously this is part of the national uh, preclinical revision course. So uh, hopefully this, this looks familiar. It's the left hand side of your syllabus. This is what we're aiming to cover today. Um, so we're going to be going over really gross anatomy. I'm, I'm leaving off the, the cortex microstructure, um, but we'll crack through um, the cortex, thalamus and hypothalamus. Um, and um, if any of you want to know a little bit more about the motor systems, we covered them in a lecture previously, so hopefully that's available on, on YouTube. Um, this is our plan. Um, so I say death by neuroanatomy. Um, please bear with me. Um, it's going to be hard and fast, but hopefully it'll help. Um, so it's a gyro and the sulci, the tracks of the comma shears. And then I've got, uh, I think, a 10 question um, sort of practice MCQ cranial nerve quiz, all based off questions that we can remember coming up in our in our practices or in um, in our exam. Um, and then a couple of, um, and then we'll quickly whiz through the thalamus and the hypothalamus and then we'll finish all up. So I reckon maybe, you know, 40, 45 minutes it'll, it might take us. So without further ado, um, the big stuff, the gyro and the sulci, so the, sort of the wavy stuff that makes the brain look the way it does. Um, so the big two to remember are the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus. So the precentral gyrus is, is where the, oh, just been delivered a cup of tea, thank you. And the precentral gyrus is, um, is M1, so it's where the primary motor cortex is. That's receiving, um, sorry, that's projecting via the internal capsule um, down all the way through the spinal cord. So that's the, um, the corticospinal tract that that's forming. Um, and in M1, hopefully this is all ringing a bell, um, there's, um, you have this somatotropic representation. So you have this motor homunculus, which is a slightly funny image of, of, of a human with overrepresentation of, of areas that have, um, you know, uh, sort of more, sort of have, have more fine movements, so like big tongue and fairly little legs. Um, within the precentral gyrus, the leg is um, more like the most medial structures, the most sort of midline structure, and the face and the arm are more lateral. And the reason uh, that's important, or you need to be aware of that, is because of the different arterial supply to um, the two areas. So if you get a stroke in the anterior cerebral artery, you're, you need to be thinking about, um, or the patient will probably present with problems with their legs. Um, so whereas um, face and arm uh, presentation is more likely to be an, an MCA um, an MCA problem. Um, obviously that lesion will cause contralateral paralysis. So that's paralysis on the opposite side of the body to where the part of the brain is. That makes sense. Um, the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus are separated by the central sulcus, only important because it divides two. Um, and that leads us nicely onto the postcentral gyrus, which is S1, so the primary somatosensory cortex. And that's receiving input from um, thalamocortical radiations, so from the thalamus, um, predominantly from the ventral posterior medial and ventral posterior lateral nuclei. Um, if that all sounds a bit confusing, don't worry, we're coming back to that um, near the end of the talk. Um, and that, that represents sort of, uh, well, all of somatotopia, but you know, touch and temperature um, as um, hom homunculi, so much the same as um, in function, really, I, I guess, conceptually, as in M1. Um, but obviously, a lesion here is going to cause contralateral loss of nociception, which is you know, converted to pain, or thermoception, so detection of temperature. Um, and you can see here on the two diagrams, uh, you need to be able to, for the exams, um, locate it both in sort of cross section, which you can see in the, the, the bottom image, and then also sort of in, in gross. Um, so next thing you need to know about is the insula. Again, here we've got we've represented it in various views. And I was really just trying to, with all the images, find the different views that could, could be coming up in the exam, because you need to be able to uh, recognize it on a wet slice, which is what the diagram on the left is sort of isn't, but is, you know, is hopefully going to enable you to do. And then also that sort of section so it's it's being able to recognize it in different planes that i think can be slightly confusing so it's just worth sort of remembering obviously the brain is a 3d structure and therefore you need to be able to pinpoint things in 3d space and hopefully that helps with trying to understand how things flow and connect anyway yeah so we've got the insula here so it's a um you see in the left hand side diagram um it's sort of that that squ squiggle um it's really involved in consciousness and emotion, these sort of um, very complex um, 
proce processing of, of input. And the advantage of that means it's so complicated, we don't really understand it, so you don't need to know it in a lot of detail. Um, the anterior insula, though, um, forms the primary gustatory cortex, which sort of touched upon in the previous lecture. Um, so you need to be thinking, um, you know, if they're talking about a patient presenting with um, sort of funky taste symptoms, you know, taste something that's not there. Um, you need to be, then then that sort of makes you think of a problem with the insula. And fairly self-explanatory given um, its role in this. There's afferent and efferent sensory cortical projections. Um, next section, so same diagram. So hopefully you, you're sort of beginning to figure out how things kind of can relate to each other because a classic five-part MCQ would just be pointing to various sections of the same slice and asking you what's going, you know, what is here. Um, we've got the dentate gyrus, um, which is part of the hippocampal formation, uh, which is responsible for, for new episodic memories. Um, and you can see it's sort of the, the, the medial sector of so that section of that hippocampal theoretically seahorse-like curl that you have there, um, which brings us nicely onto the hippocampus. So the hippocampus has reciprocal projections from the limbic system, and it, it projects out via the entorhinal cortex to, to the neocortex. Um, and the hippocampus really is involved in, in, in spatial memories. So maybe this concept of place cells and grid cells are, are ringing a bell. Um, so it's this idea that you have cells that fire when you're in a particular location um, or actually sort of networks of cells that fire in a particular location. And as, as you move, um, different cells fire. And they, um, the way they found that out was those um, big... Uh, paddling pools filled with condensed milk so the so the the water went all cloudy and as the rats moved around they could trying to locate the sort of the platform which to get out on they could see the different cells firing um and really the point of all um well i, I suppose i could i suppose actually a separate point of the hippocampus is 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 this sort of it's also got this involvement in the consolidation of short term to to, to long-term memories and where this all gets quite interesting for you guys as medics, I think, is when you start to see what happens when you have a problem there. And um, this classic example, I'm sure it's been talked about before in lectures, is this patient HM who um, had his, both his hippocampi um, whipped out and he had um, no semantic or episodic memories um, you know, from this point of removal onwards, but he still could retain emotions and he could still um retain sort of his motor learning so the classic example is he got very very he never played, played table tennis before he had them removed but um the scientists would come and play table tennis with him and he got very very good but every time you asked him do you know how to play table tennis he said no never played it in my life you know and then pick up the bat and be rather good at it um so it's this idea of of, of learning really being separate rather than i think um colloquially we think of it as all one process but you can actually sort of split out you know sp spatial memories from from sort of motor learning as well. Um, the only other um, sort of uh, pathological process to be aware of in relation to the hippocampus is Alzheimer's disease. So in Alzheimer's, you see a, a thinning of the hippocampus and enlargement of the ventricles. Um, the ventricles, which you can see on the sort of the middle um, centre of the brain in the diagram, these are these um, um, CSF filled spaces and sort of in inverted commas holes in the brain in the middle that you see. Um, so enlargement of the, the, the ventricle sort of by definition means shrinking of the brain as such. My slide stuck. Cool. Um, and then surrounding the hippocampus is the parahippocampus. Um, that's involved in the limbic system, which is as hopefully you're aware, emotion, sort of broadly speaking, emotional processing. Um, the parahim campus, you don't need to know in great detail, but just as awareness, that it's also involved in, in memory encoding, but also memory retrieval um, and thought to be important for um, scene recognition. And I think if you think about it logically, that makes sense. We've got the hippocampus at place cells that's firing when you are in a particular area, area, and then the region next to it sort of being involved in um, thus understanding, you know, which region you're in, which, which, re, um, which space um, you're in. Um, and then we've also got the the uncus, which you can see, um, which is realistically, um, to be honest, part of the parahippocampus, but anatomically slightly distinct. Um, and that's part of the olfactory cortex. So why is that important? Because if you get a little vignette and the person is talking about um, olfactory um, symptoms, so sort of smell problems, obviously it can be all the way back to, you know, they've just got a runny nose or problems with the cribriform plate. Uh, but a possibility is also a lesion in in the uncus and you can see these on the diagram here and the left and that this is sort of the relation of, of all the um regions we talked about 
um, previously. And um, so you can see the parahippocampus comes round the hippocampus, and then you've got the dentate gyrus up um, sort of, I say more cranially, but um, you know, more to the north of the image. Moving on, um, we've got the cingulate gyrus, so that's receiving inputs from the thalamus and the neocortex and um, projecting out via the entorhinal cortex to the hippocampus. So you, you see it's this huge sort of um, band of brain all the way around the corpus callosum. So this sort of central section of the brain. Um, and you don't need to know about it in too much detail other than be able to um, point it out on a diagram. Um, and to, uh, to understand really, it's, it's, it's this major form of sort of connections between, between sections of the brain. Um, then we've got the lateral sulcus, um, which is also known as the sylvian fissure, slightly confusingly. Um, and lateral sulcus is um, a really crucial one to know about because it's a location of, uh, because it's, sorry, it's not location, because it forms a border of the superior temporal gyrus, which is this major band around the side of the brain, uh, which you can see in two views on the, well, three views on the diagram. So the temporal, tem superior temporal gyrus is a location of A1, so the primary auditory cortex but also um, Wernicke's area on the dominant hemisphere, so in most people on the left-hand side. So um, A1, or the primary auditory cortex, is receiving input from the medial geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. Again, more on that later. And um, just like M1, uh, we've got this homunculus. Here it's auditory. Um, and we have, and there's, you have an auditory homunculi, but you also have a frequency map. So there's basically, um, you're, you're sort of layering two levels of information. Um, and fairly understandably, a lesion in this area is going to cause a loss of sound awareness. Um, and however, because it's not the only input point, you still have this reflexive response to sound maintained. So that's a sort of loud bang, and you know, and you know, you're shocked, or you, you know, you hear something, and you immediately turn towards it. But there's a sort of um, a lack of more complex processing of sound, if that makes sense. Um, we've just mentioned Wernicke's, but um, the obvious other area to mention is Broca's. Again, both of these locations are the dominant hemisphere, so in, in most of us, that's on our left-hand side. Um, Wernicke's is this is a slightly oversimplistic view, but it's a good one. It's, it's a good one to maintain when you're trying to answer sort of the part A question. So Wernicke's is involved in the comprehension of language, so it's sort of the understanding, um, and thus, if you get a lesion in the area, um, it's going to lead to something called fluent aphasia. So it's when you're when you can speak perfectly, perfectly. It sounds perfectly normal if you walk past someone. You know the rhythm is normal, the syntax is normal. But actually, when you hear the what the words that they're saying, it's just a meaningless babble, um, because of you know this impaired comprehension of language. Whereas brokers um, is involved in the production of language. So um, you're going to get a lesion in the area will cause non-fluent aphasia. So the words are going to make sense, but they're going to, it's going to be what's known as telegraphic speak, which basically when you whip out um, some of the um, some of the sort of connecting words. So it sounds very sort of jumpy to point. So it might be um, to take an example of this paragraph here, you might be saying um, production, language, division, clear not. So you see it doesn't flow beautifully, but you can still sort of de um, hopefully derive a meaning from 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 what I was saying. New section of the brain, the orbitofrontal gyrus. It's the stuff right at the front. So it's, this is all part of the prefrontal cortex. And this has a, has a colossal number of inputs and outputs, which you really, really do not need to learn. But just to have a broad awareness that it's receiving input from every sensory modality, except perhaps auditory. Um, it's receiving input from the medial dorsal nucleus of the thalamus and reciprocal connection to the entorhinal cortex, hypothalamus, and amygdala. And this area is involved in decision making. Um, classic patient example is Phineas Gage, who was the chap who was the railroad worker, who had the rod that went straight through, um, among other parts of the brain, the orbital frontal cortex, and developed this ungodlike, in inverted commas, behaviour. So this disinhibited uh, behaviour picture. Um, and there's this, this has sort of led to this idea that perhaps um, it's, uh, you know, an impairment of the function um, or a sort of structural impairment of the orbital frontal gyrus that might be contributing to uh, the symptoms seen in a form of dementia known as frontal temporal dementia, where again you see this um, sort of disinhibited behaviour be, um, be a key part of the presentation. Easy anatomy question, it's the part of the brain that's right at the front. <laughs> <laughs>
So from right at the front to right at the back, um, the V1, the primary visual cortex, is on the banks of the post calcarine sulcus, which you can see in the lower half of the diagram very clearly. So uh, from the outside of the brain, it's not a very large amount, but it sort of extends quite quite far in. Um, and as you might have guessed from, from all the other primary air, um, sensory areas, here we have a retinotopic map. Um, again, as is usual, we've got the left uh, visual field being represented on the right and the right visual field being represented on the left hand side of the brain. And again, in this slightly um, bizarre situation, the upper banks of the sulcus represent the lower half of the visual field and vice versa. So it's just remember that everything's crossed over. Um, so this is receiving input from um, obviously eventually from the eye, but then that's leading to the um, lateral geniculate nucleus and from there via the optic radiations. These optic radiations could be separated into two. So we've got the in inferior retina fibers, also known as Mayer's loop, which um, loop indirectly through the temporal lobe to V1 from the LGN. Um, and they're taking all of the superior visual field information. So all the stuff that was at the top of your visual field. Thus, if you get a lesion in this area, which is more common given the longer loop, um, you get this what's known as a superior quadrantinopia pie in the sky image. So you you know basically one half of the top part of your vision you can't see. Conversely, the superior retina fibers, which go straight through the parietal lobe to V1, um, transmit inferior visual field information. And a lesion there is going to cause inferior quadrantinopia or a pie in the floor. Outputs from V1 um, project via the ventral what stream in the dorsal where stream so the ventral stream this what stream project to the inferior temporal cortex and that's involved in form recognition and object representation what um, whereas the, the dorsal stream project to the dorsal medial area and the posterior parietal cortex and that's that sort of where so um, it's setting motion but also objects location and control of eyes and the arms but the um, a classic question, so a really important bit of information to remember, is the fact that all this area is supplied by the posterior cerebral artery. So visual problems, you're thinking PCA. I've put this in. It's a bit of a nasty full-on diagram because it's an absolute dream to examine you guys on. So therefore, it's a really key one to know. Excuse me, just having a sip of tea. So this is um, the visual defect, the visual defect, sorry, and the corresponding um, anatomical location of the lesion. So the little bits that are um, a really good one to, to, to really bit, really key bits to pick up upon are things like, because um, a lot of it's self-explanatory, but things like the optic chiasm can be a bit of a bit of a funky one where you get this crossing over. Um, so uh, visual information before the optic chiasm is based on what each retina sees, but beyond the optic chiasm where you have the decussation, um, it's based on what, um, what half of the visual fields it's in. Um, and a lesion in the, the optic chiasm is going to cause something called bitemporal hemianopia. Um, beyond there, you've got optic tract lesions, you get homo homonymous hemianopia, apologies. Then we've got these Mayers and superior loop that we talked about, which are giving you the pie in the sky and the pie in the floor. Um, and that takes you all the way around. At area seven, so this is sort of the end of the optic radiations, you're seeing this um, complete interruption, this complete homon homonymous hemianopia. But crucially, you often get macular sparing. So that's sparing of the central bit of the vision, which is an absolute key one for distinguishing where it's happening, because otherwise it's very difficult to tell the difference between a lesion at, at anatomical location seven and, and elsewhere. It, and it's because often the macula is, is bi-represented, so it's represented on, on, on both sides. There's co effective compensation. That's just a little sort of exam tip to really, really log. Anyway, that's it for gyro and sulci. So we're moving on to the tracks and the commissures, which is basically the you know the connections and such. Um, so these are sort of I think nastier and slightly less intuitive to to learn about. But the thing to think about is just where they're coming from and where they're going to, and then you can sort of infer the function. So um, the internal capsule is an absolute biggie. Um, you can see it here. It's between the the, the uh, it's just lateral to the thalamus. Um, and um, and just medial to the putamen and globus pallidus of the basal ganglia. Um, and that's afferents and efferents um, to and from the cortex. 
and it, the corticospinal tract is flowing straight through, uh, projecting straight through the internal capsule. So that's, um, if you remember from the motor lecture, that's um, outputs from M1, from the primary motor cortex, um, to lower motor neurons in the spinal cord. Um, and I've got here a, a little point about the um, the blood supply, which is a bit of a bit of a nasty one if they ask you on that. But it's just worth noting that the large part of the blood supply um, is from the lenticulo striate branches of the MCA, which I think, as far as you're aware, is just the fact that you've got these MCA um, sort of projection, um, you know, supply from the MCA to the in internal capsule. Um, but it does mean that um, a classic symptom. Um, albeit not that common, of chronic hypertension is you get an infarct of these branches and that can result in um, contralateral hemorrhoresis, so um, paralysis of the other half of the of the body. That's just a sort of little little extra to to um, to pick up upon, but it must be quite a nasty question in exam to ask you about that. Um, other tracts and commas just to know about. Um, so the two connecting um, the right and the left hand side of the brain are the corpus callosum and the anterior commissure. Uh, to differentiate them, you've got the corpus callosum more superior and the anterior commissure more inferior. The corpus callosum, it's the, it's, it's the biggie. It's a connection between the left and right hemispheres from all parts of the brain, whereas the anterior commissure tends to just be the, the temporal lobe. Um, and you can see the corpus callosum here in cross section. So you've got these, oh, sorry, um, you've got these sort of four sections to it. So the, you've got the rostrum, which is the um, frontal end, the jenny, the knee, the body, which is the vast majority of it, and then curling round at the end, the, um, the splenium. That's it for, for death by neuroanatomy. I'm sorry if that was a bit horrid. Um, there's a lot to crack on through. Uh, and it is really just a rote learning exercise, which is absolutely horrid for you guys. But now for something a little bit more interactive, a bit different, we've got 10 questions on cranial nerves and as I say these are all uh, sort of M MCQs or true and falses that we can remember coming up in our exams so it's on Socrative so if you go on Socrative and you type in Brockwell 4802 still slide then I'm just going to stop sharing I'll pop that in the chat um the code in the chat and then hopefully we can we you guys can have a little go and we can uh, sort of assess your cranial nerves quiz if you don't know um any of the answers don't worry we've got a big slide next where we where we won't go through in too much detail, but basically you don't have anything on that and you'll nail every cranial nerve question that ever comes up. So Rockwell 4802, and I'll just start up the quiz. Okay. OK, so hopefully you can all see that now. So question number one um, is a true or false. Um, the hypoglossal nerve provides sensory innovation of the tongue. OK, brilliant. So three quarters of you got it right. So um, the hypoglossal is a nasty question. Actually, the hypoglossal is the, is the motor. Um, innovation of the tongue. Question number two, uh, another true or false, sorry, I, I promise you some of them are multiple choice. Um, the vestibular cochlear nerve leaves the skull with the glossopharyngeal nerve. So that's about knowing your um, foramina and what flows through them or projects through them, I should say. Yeah, it's another false one, I'm afraid. So the vestibular cochlear nerve leaves via the internal acoustic meatus, which I think if you saw it written down might be a bit of a trigger, obviously, because um, acoustics a giveaway there. Um, whereas the glossopharyngeal is actually via the jugular foramen. Question number three, the facial nerve conveys taste information from the anterior two thirds of the tongue. True or false? So this actually cropped up in, in yesterday's lecture. So that's absolutely true, as I can see the majority of you went for. So brilliant stuff, guys. Question number four, the vagus nerve contains motor neurons. Okay, okay, even split. Um, so that's 
absolutely true. The vagus nerve does contain motor neurons. Um, the trigeminal nerve is entirely sensory. So the trigeminal nerve is 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 sensory for the mace the, for the face and the dura, but it's actually motor for the muscles of mastication, so chewing. Okay, we're on to the multiple choice now. So the cranial nerve that leaves the skull for the through the foramen rotundum. And your options are cranial nerve four, six, seven, eight, and oh, they've shuffled around. I put six in twice. Okay, um, so four, six, seven, and eight. Smashing the majority of you, you've gone for absolutely the right answer. Um, yeah, it's it's cranial nerve seven that leaves through the foramen rotundum. What about the cranial nerve that provides sensation for the gag reflex? So we've got eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, a bit tricky here, a bit more divided. Right, okay. Majority for the right answer though, brilliant. That's cranial nerve nine. What about this? Horses of the voice would be caused by damage to the eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, or twelfth. Oh, that's a very good question in the chat. Do they always put either the number or the name? No, they're probably going to give you the name and the number. Sorry, that's that's me being um, being lazy with writing the questions. Yeah, you're going to get both in the exam. Or well, certainly we did anyway. So um, anyway, regardless, you guys have steamed ahead and most have gone for the right answer. So that's cranial nerve 10. Um, what about the nerve innervating the sternomastoid and the trapezius? So we've got 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 there again. Um, so that's 8, vestibular cochlear, 9, glossopharyngeal, 10, vagus, 11, spinal accessory, and 12, hypoglossal. OK, fantastic. Um, so that absolutely right, guys. That's the. Um, sternocly sternocleidomastoid, sternomastoid and trapezius are innervated by the spinal accessory, which is uh, number 11. So brilliant. Well done. And last but not least, a um, little bit of literary reference here for you all. Mr. Orwell presents to a GP in Paris complaining of a headache and difficulty seeing out of his right eye. Which cranial nerve is most likely to be damaged? And you've got three, four, five, six, seven. Oculomotor, trochlear, trigeminal abducens, and facial. Okay, majority of you come for the right answer. It's cranial nerve three, so that's the oculomotor. Right, that's it for the questions I've got on. So we'll um, we'll move on to sort of content now. Let's get back onto sharing. Okay. So. I'll leave this up for a sec, but this is this is the big nasty. Uh, I'll minimize that. Sorry, you can't see it. This is the big nasty page of everything you need to know about cranial nerves. Um, probably at, at your stage, you can get away without knowing the clinical exam. Clinical exam, but um, the function, the clinical problems, and um, the frame it passes through are the absolutely the vital bits and bobs to to nail. And it's a really horrid one because I think most of it's not that self-explanatory and a lot of it is just rote learning. Um, but they're classic questions. And once you learn them, obviously, they're really high yield. But until that point, they can be really tricky and very tough to guess. Um, there's all sorts of rude um, things you can learn to sort of help, help you remember which order they are and what number they are. 
um, but I, I shan't, shan't recite them here. Um, but I won't talk you through this, but I will leave it up for 10 seconds or more. So if you want to, you can just screenshot it and stick it in your notes or whatever. Obviously, all these slides are available afterwards once you fill out the feedback form as well. Um, right. OK. We'll crack on. So now for something I can actually talk through. So we've got the thalamus um, and hypothalamus to go. So bear with me. We're cracking on through, we're making great time, guys. We're we're almost there. So the thalamus it's a mid is a midline symmetrical structure, um, and it's the hub between the subcortical areas and the cortex. And um, a key bit for your exams to to remember is that this is a hub for every sensory system. Every sensory system has a thalamic relay except olfactory, which is a nice one for them to ask you. Um, and it's also involved in regulation of, of sleep and, and wakefulness. Um, and we've got the big diagram on the left here, and we're going to crack on through um, where um, you know, the, the functions of the different um, nuclei of the thalamus. Um, but just so you know, absolutely learn where it is on a um, section of the brain. It's that big red arrow, that big ball right in the central in the middle. So let's start. Anterior nuclei of the thalamus. So these are involved in the limbic system. So um, th these receiving input from the fornix, from the mimulothalamic tract, which is from the mimulonary body, so thalamus. Um, and these areas in turn are receiving input from the hippocampus and cervicium. And it's projecting to the cingulate gyrus and orbitofrontal cortex. Why do you need to know about it? Because it's those mimulothalamic tr tract neurons that are damaged in Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, which you might be able to remember is that is um, happens when people are alcoholics and they're uh, thiamine deficient, and it results in them having episodic memory deficits. That's when it's going to come up in your in exams. So next, we've got the ventral anterior and ventral lateral nuclei, uh, the VL and VA on, on, on the big diagram here. Um, and these are involved as the motor hubs. So they're receiving input from the cerebellum and basal ganglia, and they're uh, projecting onto the primary motor cortex, the premotor areas. Um, so fairly self-explanatory if they're in this area, they're involved in motor feedback. This is the sort of level you need to know, so not too much detail, but just a broad understanding of the function of the different areas. Then we've got the ventral posterior medial and um, ventral posterior lateral nuclei. Um, so these are involved in um, somatosensory relay. So the ventral posterior medial is receiving um, input from the um, trigeminal nerve. Uh, to try general thalamic input, and it's projecting to the postcentral gyrus of S1. Um, the ventral posterior lateral nuclei also projecting to S1, but it's receiving input from the medial limbal and spinothalamic pathways. Then we've got the lateral geniculate nucleus and the medial geniculate nucleus. So these are the two little lumps at the bottom. Um, these are probably the two uh, ones that are going to come up the most um, because they nicely fit into visual and auditory processing. So the lateral geniculate nucleus is involved in visual processing. So it's receiving input from the optic tract via retinal ganglion cells. Um, and also, um, sorry, it's projecting. <laughs> now I'm getting muddled on side. So it's, so it's receiving input from the optic tract via retinal ganglion cells and then also from the reticular activating system. So that's when we mentioned previously the role of the thalamus in sleep-wake cycles. Um, and it's projecting via the um, inferior and superior optic radiations all the way over to the um, uh, primary visual nucleus in the occipital cortex. And then we've got the medial geniculate nucleus, um, which is involved in auditory processing. So that's receiving input from the inferior nucleus and projecting up to the auditory cortex. And then we've got the pulvinar nucleus, which is also involved in visual um, processing so that's got but here it's slightly funky it's sort of re it's receiving these reciprocal visual cortico cortical interactions and the because it's called pulvinar that's a bit weird it's not the same as the name for anything else that's how i remember it's a bit of an odd one it's, it's slightly different in in its in its, its structure to to the others um, it also has connections to the superior colicus and dorsal dorsal visual stream um, and that's so it also has its involvement in visual attention that's the thalamus done. So only the hypothalamus to go. So we're making cracking time. Hopefully you're all still with me. Um, hypothalamus um, has um, obviously you know it's neuroendocrine, and and its neuroendocrine function can be separated into the direct and indirect. So direct is via the posterior pituitary. So basically parts of the hypothalamus that directly screw stuff. 
Um, and in the posterior pituitary, you've got the super optic nucleus, which secretes both oxytocin and vasopressin or ADH. And this is where you get to use your, your, um, your good preclinical knowledge. Really. So oxytocin is involved in uterine contractions and lactation, uh, whereas vasopressin um, has actions on the water reabsorption and concentrating urine. From a neuro point of view, this is sort of the level you need to know, but obviously renal wise, it gets a little bit more complicated. Right? Um, we mentioned these are sort of the direct effects, but there are also the indirect effects, which are sadly multiple. So um, these involve the anterior pituitary. So you have sort of four key areas to know about. So the paraventricular nucleus will secrete thyrotropin releasing hormone and corticotropin releasing hormone, which in turn stimulate thyroid, respectively, thyroid stimulating hormone release and um, ACTH release. I think the nice thing here is that the names make sense. So the sort of the two, the right hand side two columns are fairly self explanatory, but it's the left hand side one that's the important, important one to really learn. Then you've also got the arcuate nucleus, which um, secrete dopamine and um, GHRH, so um, sorry, growth hormone, releasing hormone. So dopamine will inhibit prolactin release, and a growth hormone, releasing hormone, will release hormone. So it's the growth hormone, so it will stimulate growth hormone release. Um, then you've got the preoptic area, um, uh, which is gonadotrophin releasing hormone, um, which stimulates follic follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Um, or the release of them. And then you've also got the periventricular nucleus, um, which is the matostatin, which inhibits growth hormone release. So you can see sort of um, the arcuate nucleus and the periventricular nucleus sort of have um, reciprocal um, roles, sort of control growth hormone. But these slides are just to make it super simple. But as I say, unfortunately, these are just, this is a rote learning exercise. Unfortunately, that's what a lot of neuroanatomy is, is like. I know that's really tough, you guys, but hopefully over these slides, we managed to sort of boil it down to the the super high yield stuff that's going to come up in in part a so you will be an absolute whiz um the only other bit to to cover on the syllabus that we haven't sort of touched upon so far is the regulation of circadian rhythm so we've got a nice little an anatomical diagram here of the bits we're going to talk about in a sec but i'll pull up the uh, the text now um so the bit that's super important for this is suprachiasmatic nucleus. Actually, you know, I'll pop back to the previous slide and you can see exactly where it is. So it's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus because it's superior to the optic chiasm, that crossing over. Um, and this is receiving inputs from the retinohypothalamic tract, which sounds scary, but it's person from the retina and hypothalamus, um, which in turn is getting in, so it's getting these inputs from from photosensitive ganglion cells. Um, it's also um, inputs from the Geniculo hypothalamic tract and the raphonucleus, and it's projecting to the subparaventricular zone and the dorsal medial hypothalamic nucleus. Why is this important? So the suprachiasmatic nucleus is therefore involved in the regulation of body temperature rhythms and sleep and motor activity, um, and also um, modulating hormone production. And the two hormones, I think it's for, you could almost guess what they are. It's cortisol and melatonin. So melatonin is the one that people take when they want to get get to sleep faster, and cortisol is always that long-term stress re stress response and um it's a bit sim simplistic this is an overview of circadian rhythm it's a little bit more complicated but really the most important thing is down is, is linking the subchiasmatic nucleus in your head to regulation of circadian rhythm and also being able to identify it um, on a cross-sectional anatomical diagram um, 